Father, we just ask that you would speak to our hearts, Lord God. Your word is alive, it is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Please, God, Lord, show us what we need to hear today. And we wouldn't just be playing church. Now, those days are over. There's a lot called church that is so unbiblical, God, it is opposite of what your word says. Lord Jesus, you told us when we see all these various things coming to pass, to look up our redemption draweth nigh, and Lord, we do. We love you, Jesus, and ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We pick up at verse 16. For who, having heard, rebelled, indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry, God angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now, as I said, this epistle is written to people who were Hebrew as far as their ethnicity or their race, which up until the first century... All Hebrews were Jewish as far as their religion. All of that changed at the first coming of Jesus Christ. While he was rejected by the nation and by the majority of Jews, there were quite a few Hebrews who left Judaism to follow Jesus as their long-awaited Messiah. That didn't sit well with their Jewish families and their friends who not only shunned them, but they persecuted them. You look at Acts chapter 7, they stoned Stephen to death. The Jews stoned this man for telling them the truth. All of this was brand new. They didn't have 2,000 years of church history to look back on as we do, and you know, a church on every corner with a nice steeple and everything. They were the ones establishing Christianity, and the persecution and the pressure upon these first century Hebrew believers was come, becoming so intense that they were being tempted to return to Judaism, which the writer here explains, sorry, it's too late. There's no turning back. Now, I've shared probably ad nauseum of my own experience coming out of Roman Catholicism. You know, 32 years old, you know, to get saved out of Roman Catholic religion and the pressure that came upon my wife and I from our family for abandoning this multi-generational religion that we had grown up in. Of course, we're in a cult, dude. We read the Bible. We pray, dude. We, we go to church like every day. What kind of cult are you guys in? You're not at the, bar, at the bar anymore. You're not smoking weed anymore. We like that person. And he goes to church, you know, and he's religious. But what happened to you? I was born again. And the, it, while it would have taken the pressure off to go back to Mass and go to the priest and the liturgy, that was impossible. How could I leave my Lord and Savior? You're not just leaving one religion for another. Biblical Christianity, and you have to define that these days because there's a lot of religious Christianity, but biblical Christianity is a relationship with the living Lord. That's what the author of this epistle reminded the Hebrews he's writing to in the opening chapters. If I am genuinely saved, I have a personal connection with the living God through Jesus Christ that he has graciously provided. It's not something I earned or worked for. It's a relationship of trust. I've been presented with the gospel. It sounds incredible that a man 2,000 years ago hanging on a cross could take away all of my guilt and shame and fill me with eternal life. And yet that man, he wasn't just any man. You know, it's 2022, 2022 years since that man was on this earth. He splits time, A.D., B.C., Jesus Christ on the cross, God in human flesh, Abe, the only one able 
and his sacrifice. He died in my place, took the penalty for all my sins and placing my faith in what he has done for me. I am reborn spiritually. I come alive in the spirit. For the very first time, the spirit of the living God dwells within me. And I become what the writer here calls in verse 6 of chapter 3, a member of the household of God. A spiritual house over which Christ, the Son of God, presides as Lord. Now that metaphor is used throughout the New Testament as this picture of God building a dwelling place. That's what this earth is simply for God to, to prepare an eternal dwelling place. This world is simply the place where people are offered the opportunity. Do you want to be part of what God is establishing or not? He's not going to force anybody. And you see this picture, if you turn to the book of Ephesians, go left in your Bible, a few books. Ephesians chapter 2. So what the, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, writing to non-Jews, verse 19 of chapter 2 of Ephesians. It says, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles, prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. It's towards the back of the book. find the reference I'm looking for here. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we turn to Revelation 21. Okay. I'll read you 1 Peter 2. I was in the wrong book. Sorry about that. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. And then Revelation 21. It says... At verse 1, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is the, the finished building. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Because the Bible is a timeless book, God dwells outside of time, we're able to see our ultimate destiny in advance. All of the New Testament passages that speak of God's people being built into a spiritual dwelling place for God to live with them culminate in what we see here in Revelation 21. When our relationship with God will just be beginning. This is what he's preparing so that he can dwell with us. We can dwell with him. And this is what we're being prepared for presently. And so turning back to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, when he speaks of Christ being son over his house, that's what it's speaking of, whose house we are, the writer says, in verse 6, Hebrews 3 whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. 
Now, you want a working definition of biblical Christianity. This is one of many examples here in the New Testament. A biblical Christian is someone who holds fast to that confidence that I have in the Lord's sufficient sacrifice. A sufficient sacrifice that has brought me into this living union with God by removing all the guilt of my sins and giving me eternal life from which I derive my source of joy, as it says here, my rejoicing. And whenever I'm down, when I'm tempted to discouragement or defeat, all I got to do is look at the cross. You think you're unloved? You know, remember what God has done for me, how much he loves me. What more could he possibly do? The cross is God's declaration to the unsaved world that if you're going to go to hell, you're going to go over my dead body. I love you that much. That is where my joyful hope that I'm confidently holding fast to, firm to the end, that is where it is found. And what are you confidently holding fast to for your hope? That's what I ask people. So I go around and meet people throughout the week and doing different ministries. You know, where's your hope lying? And a lot of people are completely hopeless these days. They know this world is upside down. It's going completely crazy. What are you clinging to? When people are clinging to, you know, various, your career. What if the economy just tanks, which it's on the verge of doing? Well, you you're putting your trust in the government. Good luck for that. You know, your retirement plan. What if it goes away? Like I shared Friday night. You know, one of the most horrible things to see is to be as a pastor at the bedside of somebody. You're called. Can you just come? My uncle Harry or whatever is dying. You know, he doesn't go to church. Can you come? You come to the side of someone who has no hope. They they have never you know, trusted in anything but themselves and their money and everything of this world, and they're horrified. It's the most horrific thing to see <laughs> this person just, you know, it's, it's just spine-tingling to watch this. And then you go where somebody's saved, and, dude, they got a big smile on their face, and they're like, oh, dude, I can just, any moment, I'm going to be with the Lord. I can't wait. This declaration made in verse 6 of those being tempted to abandon this living hope in Jesus Christ, this declaration is developed now. He goes on to develop this on into chapter 4 by first issuing a warning. We looked at verse 12. It says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. See, to forsake faith in Jesus Christ alone is to forsake not a religion, but a personal relationship with God, the only means of relationship available. It's not like he's got multiple options. He said, here's the option. I will come and provide this relationship for you. You can't do it on your own. And just as I have placed my trust in him to save me, I now continue to trust in him for everything. I have to hold fast to that confidence. Verse 14 says, For we have become partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Salvation in Jesus Christ is a life that someone lives in perpetual trust of him, partaking of the grace that he gives to me every day. It's not I said a prayer back in, the, you know, 1992 and I'm saved. I, you know, I live like hell, but <laughs> I'm saved because I said this prayer. That is not what the Bible teaches. Salvation is a continual relationship growing in my relationship. I don't run my life. He does if he is truly my Lord. Jesus said many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, I, say, I never knew you. You ran your own life. Many call him Lord, but they don't serve him. That's why he says count the cost. You know, years ago, my wife and I li were living in Southern California. 
and we would go up into the San Gabriel Mountains, driving off road in this Jeep we had. These mountain trails, and one day we're way up in the mountains near the very top, and we came to a washout, about a quarter, half mile stretch. You pull up, and it's just this, no road left. You can see where the road picks up on the other side, but in between was just straight down, you know, the mountain. And we pulled up to this washer. There's a line of four-wheel drive vehicles stopped there. Everybody getting out and sizing it up. Oh, dude, I don't know if I'm going to be, well, I'm going to go through that. And after counting the cost, most people were turning around going, I don't want to get my shiny new four by dirty, you know. <laughs> but every so often, someone would come along. Well, obviously, it's been through this before, and they would just blow by everyone that beeped their horn, and they'd start going through these gigantic boulders, and they're driving through there as fast as they can, and I watched them. I saw it could be done. Did they get across, and then they're able to go up to the very top of this mountain. So I'm watching them, and the key was to just keep moving forward, looking straight ahead. You dare not stop. You don't hesitate, or you're going down the mountain. You don't just, uh, you know, freak out for a minute. So if you stop, you die. You know, you go down. It was total commitment or nothing. The only other option that most everyone else was taking was turn around, depart. I'm going to go back. But see, if you didn't go for it, you turned around and went back, you didn't get to see what very few people saw at the very top. You're able to see both sides of the mountain from as far as you can see. It's beautiful. So I told my wife, I said, close your eyes. <laughs> Hang on, you know, this is going to be a rush. And, and it was. But so is a life of complete trust and faith in Jesus Christ. It is a rush. It is. It can be scary. Trusting in a God whom you can't see, but who is in complete control of everything with or without me. Everything is going on with or without me, but with him, it's an all or nothing commitment. You can't stop. You can't turn back. I am a partaker, as it says in verse 14, only if I hold that initial confidence I place in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross to provide for me, I need to hold that steadfast to the end, verse 14 says. As I said last time, the English word confidence in verse 6 and in the word confidence in, in verse 14 are two different Greek words. The confidence spoken of in verse 6 comes from a, a word expressing the assurance or the certainty that I have in Christ for salvation. The word confidence in verse 14 comes from a different Greek word that speaks of the assurance or certainty that I have now that I am saved, of receiving everything I need for my earthly life as a partaker of Christ or in this relationship. My life here on earth is a life continually, moment by moment, participating in the eternal life of my Savior. I may live in this world but I'm already participating in the next, preparing for that, calling other people. Invitation, dude, this is the call that's gone out to the world. Today or now, if you hear his voice, verse 15 says, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Don't turn back. The writer here quotes from Psalm 95 in an appeal to his Hebrew brothers and sisters who would be well aware of this psalm. They would know this portion of scripture. He appeals to them to take heed from the example that God has preserved in his word of those who failed to lay hold of the privileged opportunity they had there in the past in what is referred to in verse 15 and in Psalm 95, simply as the rebellion. Don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Speaking of, the, of their Jewish ancestors, 
the first generation of Israelites who came out of Egypt, who God miraculously saved <laughs> through all these plagues, he parted the Red Sea, brought them out. They are introduced here at verse 16 by way of a series of rhetorical questions. As he says, for who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses and with whom was he angry 40 years? Now this conjunction for at the beginning of verse 16 is more than just connective, it's what's called interrogative. He is interrogating the reader, posing this question that is of the greatest consequence. Who was it that heard and rebelled? Was it just some random people? <laughs> Think about it. It wasn't just some ignorant people. Indeed, as he says in verse 16, was it not those who came out of Egypt that walked through the Red Sea, parted by God, led by Moses? He's emphasizing the fact that it wasn't just anybody who rebelled, who turned away. It was this special people who God had shown extreme favor to. If you are saved, that is you and I. He's using this example just to point how this happened in the past. God had shown extreme favor to these people, delivered them from slavery, harsh treatment in Egypt. That's who he's speaking of. There's a difference between never hearing and doing what's wrong. It's called ignorance. But there's also hearing, knowing what's right, and doing wrong, that's called rebellion. If I'm someone whose eyes have been opened, my heart has been opened, God has graciously saved me and put his Holy Spirit within me, now to sin is called rebellion. Before his ignorance. Who rebelled, the writer asked, verse 16. Was it not the very ones who cried out to God for deliverance from Egypt, who were praying to God, save me from their, their earthly bondage, and who God in his divine mercy through miraculous plagues and parting the sea killed the Egyptians, brought them out from that hard labor under the Egyptian taskmasters led by Moses? Now, I'm not sure how it was for anyone else. I know personally, I wasn't just minding my own business when God came along and accosted me. You're going to get saved right now, whether you like it or not. That's not how it was. Maybe it was with you. Maybe you just, you know, were minding your own business and God forced salvation upon you. I was in such a state of self-destruction that I couldn't stop. Satan had me bound and in bondage. I couldn't stop my evil behavior. And Satan was just had me as an evil taskmaster. When I cried out, God, if you exist, if you are there, these people have been telling me about this. I cried out, and in one moment of time, he delivered me from that evil taskmaster, from all my sin and all the guilt of sin. Well, now I'm going to go, thanks a lot, God, I got it from here. You know, <laughs> that's not how it works. I cried out, he did a miraculous work, and now I serve him the rest of my life on into eternity. He says here in the, in the next question, now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses died there in the desert? This is a direct reference to the book of Numbers, chapter 14. Let's turn there. It's way at the front of the Bible. Turn to Numbers, chapter 14. Fourth book of the Bible. The writer of Hebrews is making direct reference to a specific event recorded in the book of Numbers where the first generation of Israelites, having been saved out of slavery in Egypt by God's divine power, at Numbers chapter 14, it's been about a year since their deliverance. Most of the Mosaic law had been given to them. The tabernacle, the whole worship system had been built 
they were camping at an oasis in the desert called Kadesh Barnea, right on the border of the promised land that God had brought them out to bring them into this glorious land that they were going to live under God's blessings and his protection. But before they went in to conquer the land, 12 spies were sent to survey the land, to go check it out. They come back 40 days later. Man, it is everything God said it was. It's beautiful. Joshua and Caleb, two of them said, you know, with God, we can go in and take it. No problem. God's promise. It's everything he said it would be. But 10 other spies gave an evil report. Dude, there's giants in the land. We can't kill them. Their cities are walled up to the sky. We're like grasshoppers. It's impossible. And they started wearing down the faith with that report. It says in chapter 14, verse 1, so all the congregation lifted their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. If only we had died in the wilderness. It's like, thanks a lot. <laughs> oh, God. But anyway, why, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's select a leader and return to Egypt, back to slavery. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation, the children of Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, Caleb, son of Je Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. They spoke to the congregation, the children of Israel. The land we passed through, it despised its exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land. Give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. In other words, it provides all its own food in abundance. Just don't rebel against the Lord. Don't fear the people of the land. They are our bread. Their protection has departed from them because the Lord is with us. Don't fear them. And all the congregations said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, how long are these people going to reject me? How long will they not believe me with all the signs, all these miracles I performed among them? I will strike them with pestilence, disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. And Moses said to the Lord, but Lord, then the Egyptians are going to hear about it. All the non-Jewish people are going to hear that by your might you brought these people out of there. You brought them out, but you're unable to bring them in. They will tell it to the inhabitants of the land that they have heard that you, Lord, are among these people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man, the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, it's because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land. He's unable. He is not mighty. He is not all-powerful. He's not able to keep the promises that he gave. That's why he killed him. Now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying the Lord is long-suffering, abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of these people. Forgive them, Moses prays according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Then the Lord said, it's a very important verse, then the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word. So their sins were forgiven. But God, God forgave them, but truly as I live, verse 21, all the earth is going to be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory in the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to test now these ten times, 
and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land. They're not going to see the abundance which I swore to their fathers, which I promised. Nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. My servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring him into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. These, um, now the Amalekites, the Canaanites dwell in the valley tomorrow, turn and move out of the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. You don't want to go in. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness. Then have your way. Die in the desert. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number, 20 years old and above, except Caleb and Joshua. You shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, the next generation, whom you said would be victims, I will bring them in. And they shall know the land that you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. So this judgment comes upon the first generation of Israelites who had come out of Egypt and graciously provided for by God a judgment, as it says in verse 32 here, of physical death outside of the promised land. In verses 19 and 20, it says God forgave them of their sins. So it's not speaking of the loss of eternal salvation. It is an irreversible judgment that they brought upon themselves through their rebellion unto a life of wandering in a barren wilderness until they die outside of God's promised rest for them, the promised land. This is what the writer of Hebrews, turning back to Hebrews chapter 3, that's what he's referring to when he's talking <clears throat> about those who, who rebelled, man. <laughs> Was it not those that God miraculously delivered out of the land? Yeah, who, who was it? it was, that's who it was. And with whom was God angry? Was it people who were just following what he said, believing his promises? Or was it with those who sinned, whose corpus, corpses fell in the wilderness? With whom was God angry 40 years? God didn't just destroy them. He was long-suffering. He was patient for 40 years with these people, even in his anger. But his anger was in response to the people's rejection of wisdom and in, to the embracing of foolishness. God was angry because they refused to believe the truth and instead followed lies. And why wouldn't he be angry when the people he so graciously saved would not enter into everything that he saved them to enter into? And again, all of this is being applied to believers. I've been saved to enter into a glorious relationship with the Lord, not to just wait it out until he takes me to heaven. I've been saved so as to grow in this relationship, experience the blessings that God has provided for his children. And I have been saved to receive those things from him. When it says in verse 18 that those to whom God swore under oath that they would not enter the promised rest were those who did not obey. The Greek word apatheo, it speaks of specifically they did not obey because they didn't believe, they didn't trust God. And that's the point the author confirms in verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief, he says. Now it's interesting that he doesn't single out the people's worship of the golden calf. And they couldn't enter in because they worshipped the golden calf. There's no mention of just flagrant sin at Baal Peor. You can read about in Numbers as well where they transgressed with Moabite women and brought great curse upon. There's nothing about that. Nothing about all the many examples of these people's disobedience and rebellion and grumbling and complaining, none of that. 
is brought or pointed out. The greatest, most damning sin, it says in verse 19, is unbelief. That is what keeps believers from that day to today from receiving everything God has offered for me. People are saved by faith or they are lost through unbelief. It's the most dangerous, deadly of sins because if it is not reversed, it is terminal. It will destroy me. Not only am I saved through belief in God's promises, I've been offered salvation through Jesus Christ, I believe it, or I reject it, I don't believe it, and that's how many people are, but in receiving it, I believe the gospel, but then my heart is purified through believing God's promises. That's how I am sanctified, by believing what he tells me. I don't just get saved and now put on a Christian t-shirt, watch Christian movies, go to Christian concerts, but sleep with my girlfriend and live in, you know, in carnality, looking at porn on the internet or whatever the sin might be. I get saved and by faith in God's promises, I draw near to him or I don't believe him and I draw away and it says here, my heart grows hard. Believing God draws me closer. Believing him causes me to worship him. Unbelief will keep me from drawing near to God. Unbelief will keep me from receiving God's love. Unbelief will keep me from being filled with the Holy Spirit. Unbelief will keep me from obeying and following Jesus Christ. Unbelief is a ripoff. And yet, how many believers live in unbelief? They live in misery. They live in sin. They think, Did I, have, I can't help it. Well, that is what Timothy is told by the Apostle Paul is a form of godliness, but denying the power, the power thereof. God has given me the power to overcome sin in my life, not to live in it any longer. A person sitting in a prison cell with a signed and sealed pardon granting permission to leave that prison cell and walk in freedom, someone having that sitting on the table beside them in that cell untouched, unopened while they're sitting there grieving without any joy over their imprisonment, that's no different than a professing believer in Jesus Christ who has no peace and no joy in their life. How can I be anything but overwhelmed with joy knowing all my past is forgiven me? All my present has been furnished with the power I need to live for God, overcome sin, resist the devil. And my future is eternally bright. I can read about it. I can see it in the book of Revelation. All of these things are true as it, God, because God promised them to me. They don't change with my mood. They don't fall apart because I stagger in doubt. They are ironclad promises made in God's word. Unbelief will prevent me from receiving all of that that God has for me, all that he saved me for, just as he did with the children of Israel who failed to enter God's promised rest. The example that's held up here and said, you don't want to go this way. This is what happened to them. They died in a spiritual wilderness. Now he sums up this, these, th these questions here in verse 1 of chapter 4, which says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear that we don't become like them. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Therefore, or in light of these you know, questions he's asked, is pointing out these facts that happened to the Israelites, in light of that, what I am to see is that there, these Israelites... Theirs was an example, theirs was a warning to be heeded by all believers of all time. For there is a rest, he says, that God expects all those who receive his gracious deliverance to enter into. 
And in light of that example of these early Israelites and their failure to do so, and what it cost them and how it caused God to be angry with them, I'm told here in verse 1 of chapter 4, along with in my first century Hebrew Christians, brothers and sisters, I've I got to take great care. care. I've got to fear. I should fear not entering into this rest. This is not speaking of fear as in I'm afraid of God himself, the very one who saved me, who loves me enough to give his own son to die in my place so I can be with him. What I need to fear is unbelief, the, fa the failing to believe in God after all he has done for me. I need to fear my own failure to continue to not trust in him and his promises and fail to enter into the rest that he has for me as his child. Such failure, it doesn't remove me from being God's child any more than the failure of the Israelites there. They still were the children of Israel. What it does, it removes me from all the privileged blessings that God has for me as his child. Blessings that he's provided for his children and that I'm expected to receive from him. And if you're a parent, you want your kids to have all the best things. If they're living out in the gutter and they're living in total carnality and sin, it kind of breaks your heart. And it can make you angry as a parent. And it does to God. If I'm truly his child, he has saved me to be his child and to receive what he has given. That is the rest that I'm to fear not entering into. For the Israelites, it was failure to enter a, a physical promised land in which all of their needs, the land flowing with milk and honey, all their physical needs would be met. Their, all their enemies would be conquered by God. For, for believers such as those written to here and you and I, it is failing to enter the spiritual rest that is mine through the finished work of Jesus Christ, in whom all my needs are met. My peace, Jesus said, I give to you. My, it said, don't let your heart be troubled. My peace, I give to you. It's not like the world gives. I give you my peace. Do I have that? Do I live in it? Do I have total peace? These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be filled, may be full in you, Jesus said in John 15, 11. These promises, many more, uh, have, been, uh, have been extended to me to live in, to, uh, to receive promises that I can fail to enter into just because I don't believe them end up living a life of wandering in misery and sin in a spiritual wilderness. Now God's uh, failing to enter all that God has promised for me. It's, it's so important to God because if I don't, it's a reflection upon him. Just as it was for the Israelites. When I fail to enter into his rest, through my unbelief, it makes him look bad. I'm to be his witness to this unbelieving world around me, not of what I do, not just through my bumper sticker on my car, but through what God is doing within me. And so that all the, the so that the world around me can be drawn to him. When the world sees his children having supernatural peace in the midst of all the chaos going on, they know there's something different with that person. When those that God is wanting to save, unbelievers, when they see me with joy in the midst of trials and hardships, facing some physical ailments, some financial thing, whatever it may be, but I got complete joy, they're going to want to know where does that come from? Especially the days we're living in. You stand out, you know, like a, a, just a blazing light if this is how you're living. If God is working these things within you, and when they ask, I'm able to introduce them to my amazing Father. Or else I can walk around bummed out like I'm sipping lemonade. <laughs> Want to be a Christian? Not really, dude. <laughs> 
I got problems too, you know. I mean, that's a lot of people are. It's unfortunate. You look at a lot of Christians' lives, dude. You wonder, do you even have the power of the Holy Spirit living within you? Where's your joy, man? You kind of look bummed out all the time. What kind of a reflection is that on my Heavenly Father? That is a bad reflection upon Him. I'm to be His witness to this unbelieving world. And the most amazing thing about it is enable, in order to do so, all that's required of me is to rest in Him. Just trust Him. Rest in His promises that He has done it all for me. Something I can completely miss out on just because I won't believe it. I, I believe the news instead, or I believe, you know, the doctor, or I believe the banker, whoever it is, is where I'm getting my trust from. Well, that is going to collapse. I need to fear coming short of that, of not entering his promised rest. I have to fear that I will exclude myself just because of my unbelief is what he's telling the readers here. God's promises never come up short. I'm the one who will come up short, as he's saying here. Since the promise remains of entering that rest, let us fear, he says, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. This is something that I'm called to fear, and we're going to see as he moves into verse 2 of chapter 4 next time, that he's going to develop this even further. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for all that you've given to us through our relationship with Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we have been saved not through anything we've done, and we are kept by your mighty power. And Lord God, we ask that as your word, God, just comes alive to our hearts and to our mind, Lord God, that you would take it, wash over and sanctify us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit and by your power, Lord, that we can live for you, that we would trust you implicitly with our lives, especially as things grow darker and scarier and more chaotic in the world around us, that we wouldn't turn back and run back and want to go back to the world like the Israelites who came out of Egypt. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stay.